Here's to courageous pioneers who understand a legacy is multifaceted. Whether you are an independent entrepreneur or someone who is part of a family business, you too can leave something of value behind for a greater purpose. Perhaps your legacy will improve workplace cultures, seize authentic moments, or inspire others with your talent. Your host, Angelina Carlton, is the founder of Design Your Legacy, a boutique advisory firm based in Beverly Hills, California. She is a mentor and coach to leaders like you and has contributed to Alliance, a philanthropy magazine, as well as to women in family business. She has been recognized by Los Angeles Biz as an LA woman of influence, as well as by World HRD Congress for her work. Remember, you deserve great coaching because your legacy is worth completing. What if designing your legacy doesn't have to be grandiose? I'd like to welcome David Lennick, the senior editor at wealthmanagement.com. He's a New York attorney and editor with an interest in trusts and estates, as well as the host of the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Welcome, David. Thanks so much, Angelina. Actually, just to make a correction right off the bat, we uh, during the pandemic, we had to change the name of the podcast to Celebrity Estates. We uh, It turns out that sponsors aren't really chomping at the bit to... Uh, you know, during a global pandemic to sponsor something with dead in the title. I mean, quite surprising. That's this hilarious. We call the Celebrity Estates podcast now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it is a pleasure to host you on this uh, holistic podcast called Design Your Legacy, where we bring a number of different experts that are uh, knowledgeable in their field. So I thought I might start with the first question for you. And that question is, can you share some insights into the unique challenges and considerations oftentimes involved in managing estates of wealthy individuals. So obviously um, everyone's estate is complicated, right? Because you're, you're dealing with some of the scariest things that humans deal with and money, mortality, um, family, you know, these are all horrifying topics for, for the vast majority of people. You know, I think most people's biggest fears outside of maybe like heights and, and public speaking um, are pretty much encompassed in that list. Um, with wealthy families, you have all of that, plus an enormous amount of money. Um, and that just kind of turns the volume up. You, you have a lot of the same problems in terms of if you drill down to like the very base of what's causing what's going on. Um, but because of the amount of money involved, because of the assets of the, you know, the people involved in the thing, um, the scenario can be more complex and more ridiculous, even though um, you, know, you sort of have very similar problems. If anyone's ever watched the show, I'm sure they have, um, you know, succession. Um, if you watch that show and you're watching the Roy's and it's like, this is silly and crazy, you know, but it's, you know, if you look at the problems in that show, it's really just like a lot of like, I don't like my stepmom, daddy didn't love me, you know, or, you know, they don't really, it's less about the assets and more about sort of this interpersonal relationships with the family. And just because they have so much money, it's playing out in a very public way and on private jets. Yeah. And on private jets instead of over the Thanksgiving dinner table. Um, so that the big challenge, you know, it's, it's not so different planning for wealthy people, um, other than sort of the additional technical challenges, which I don't think we really is kind of beyond the scope of this podcast. Um, but just you have to kind of realize that at the end of the day, they are, they are just people and, and that a lot of their problems boil down to the same things that everyone has. Trust, relationships, communication, consideration, emotionally, emotional yeah, consideration. I say the word communication so much on my podcast that like we, I could just change the title of every episode to being about communication because it's it's the ultimate you know, all-encompassing thing for for this sort of topic. Yeah. Fascinating. I think a lot of times people have this idea and and, and we even spoke about it briefly in the preamble that uh, this idea that just because somebody is affluent that then a legacy has to be their name on the side of a library or a stadium or, or just something that is huge compared to what you called sometimes just being a good person in in courtesy and respect and manners. And I mean, that's pretty overt in a lot of these families, too. I mean, I think if you speak to a lot of wealthy, uh, you know, people who are planning their estates, a lot of their concerns around their legacy are, I don't want my child to you know, suffer from affluenza. That's sort of a, a fun, like, industry shorthand, um, you know which actually someone tried in court to make an official, uh, they, they tried to use it as a defense for their kid uh, several years back. That my kid, I think that was in Texas. Yeah, yeah, the affluenza kid. But that's like a very real thing. And so I think, you know, it's not so uncommon even for people with, you know, enormous means to sort of have these very basic goals of like, I want my kid to know an honest day's work. Um, I think what it was a Warren Buffett had a quote about like where he wants 
to leave his kids enough money to do anything they want, but not enough money so that they can do nothing. And I, that's I think that's the headspace a lot of sort of very wealthy individuals are in. Yeah, I think there's definitely a, a piece of the knowledge that is going to be technical, like uh, proprietary of that family. But I think there's another part of it before I go on to my next question, that's around emotional intelligence. And like what you had spoken about before, just being a decent, good person. And yeah, I mean, that's easier. To pa- it's easier said than done to pass that stuff on, because I mean, a lot of these times, especially when you're dealing with like a first generation sort of wealth creator situation where someone started with not much, maybe they're an immigrant, you know, sort of the American dream, um, and they spent their life building you know, be a mom or dad spent their life building this business that now is this, you know, uh, that's created all this wealth and is now sort of intertwined with their personality. And if you're doing that, chances are, you know, you haven't had too much time with your kids, you know, in that growing up and you spent a lot more time with that business. Um, and that's not really, you know, a, 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 to cast judgment on, on these people, but like that, that business just becomes when you're their baby. Well, people who to be that level of a success, the business has to become sort of intertwined with your personality and become like an extension of you. And so you end up as sort of like the parent of the business, and then you also have kids. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of they're trying. There's oftentimes with the first generation wealth creators, there's a lot of struggling to make up for lost time, and they try to like ram passing on a lot of values into a legal document or into like a two year period when it's sort of a thing that really needs to happen throughout the lifetime. It's you can't just you know teach your quote unquote kids you know all your values when they're 45. You know, it's just not going to work. Yeah, fascinating. And it's interesting today because about two thirds of today's affluent are self-made. So Mm -hmm. they're coming up and they probably have blind spots around what comes with success and what comes with all of it. I mean, that's that's what the country's built on, right? The the American dream is sort of that rags to riches story. Someone comes from somewhere else, you know, they come here and they succeed in in fantastic ways that they couldn't have in the place they were previously. Um, But then you sort of, we don't often ask, okay, well, what does that look like in the next generation? Um, because it's very easy for these businesses that are sort of cults of personalities a lot of times with the uh, the initial founder, you know, for a variety of reasons to sort of go away as the generations go on and be that because, you know, the, the founder was the business and once he's gone, there's just not that spark or maybe he holds on too long and he can't, you know, he, only he's the one who can't see the business without him and, and he sort of runs it into the ground because he gets old and bad. Um, or maybe the kids just don't care about it. And that's like a totally fine thing too. Um, but that's something that it's up to the advisors of that family to sort of suss out before it like crashes the family's, you know, wealth into, into nothing. Because at a certain point, you end up getting more focused with these families on wealth preservation than on, you know, sort of seeing the number go up. You just want to have it go down less quickly. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, an interesting dichotomy of planning. Like once you reach a certain point of wealth, it's more about preservation than about um, gaining. Absolutely. Keeping it compared to, yeah, you don't want to lose it. Yeah. So what are the key factors that you consider when creating an effective estate plan for high net worth individuals? I mean, this is a weird question a bit because effective, you could just put so many scare quotes about um, and staying out of the technicalities of, of sort of techniques and such like that. I think this is really where the communication has to come into play because you need to define what the effective state plan for that individual actually looks like because you know if um say you know in theory i'm, I'm a high-end tax planner then for me you know i'm gonna you know every for a ham for a hammer everything looks like a nail every job needs a hammer right if you're a hammer um but maybe that's not what your client cares about maybe you have one of those weird clients who's like you know what the government deserves x amount of my money you know or they want to do something else or they're they're you know they have different goals and and you only have so much time to spend working with them and focusing on this plan. And so you want to spend the most times achieving the goals they have the most effectively. And to do so, this is, I guess, kind of obvious, but you need to figure out what those goals are in the first place. And I think a shocking number of advisors in this space will kind of skip past that part and just sort of get to the dollars and cents um, when maybe that this is someone whose legacy necessarily isn't looking to be measured in dollars and cents. Interesting. So I think what you're pointing to is really getting to know who the client is, not just what they own. Yeah. And I think that's why you're seeing in the industry is the financial industry, a lot of moves into the estate planning space by financial advisors. I think they see the estate planning spaces as um, a good way to sort of backdoor, (laughs) for lack of a better term, their way into the client's relationship, into a more personal relationship with the client, 
into a relationship with their family. I mean, I make it seem sinister, but in talking from a sort of a business you know, point of view, it's not, it doesn't have to be as sinister as I just made it sound. It's honest. It's honest. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is like, if you're an advisor, you want to have strong you know, relationships with your clients so you can holistically plan for them and do a better job. And then also you want to have relationships with their kids, but so you can better holistically plan for the parent. And so that when the parent inevitably goes away, the kid knows who you are and you're not just some weirdo who showed up in a suit at dad's funeral and it's like, oh, hey, I'm your financial advisor. And the kid fires you because they don't know who the heck you are and you have no existing relationship in estate planning, you know, and the communication that's required to do it effectively um, is a really good way to sort of create those conversations. Whereas, you know, if if I'm your advisor and, and you're my client and when you just came in to see what your portfolio looks like and I just sort of awkwardly start asking you about your kids, I mean, that's sort of like, that's a weird situation. And some advisors, you know, they got the gift of gab and they can pull that off, you know, but, but a lot of people don't and they need a context. Um, and estate planning is a really good context for that because of the nature of the questions, you know, these sort of very personal questions that are required to, to do it properly. You know what I find so interesting about your answer is, is that it's almost asking that client, like, who are you and what do you want? In addition to what that advisor or the estate planner, what they think that client needs or wants. I just find well, exactly, that so interesting. Yeah. It's also one of those things, it sounds so touchy-feely, right? Like it, it's, it's like, oh, you're going to ask them, who are you and what do you want? And then you kind of roll your eyes because it's like, okay, this is hippy-dippy stuff. But, you know, the fact of the matter is in our current environment as sort of, you know, like any other industry, you know, the advice industry, automation is happening. And so while previously you used to be able to differentiate yourself as an advisor with your cutting edge techniques or your ability to build a portfolio or as an estate planner with your, you know, your sort of high end, you know, planning, you know, find ability to find loopholes, all these things, more and more your technology is able to take that place. The technology is able to crunch the numbers harder than you are. So the human advisor to really add value has to find a different, what, what the machine can't do. And so well, the- as of now, yep. Oh, yeah, sorry. and bringing the human element. Keep going. Well, exactly. You know, and that, hilariously, the human element of advice has been sorely missing for basically the entire, you know, not, I mean, the good advisors do it, but the vast majority, you know, hadn't until they were forced to now sort of by the machines, right? Well, <laughs> so, I find and, it. And that's the important element where, where that's what's going to be the difference maker now. Who does that human stuff better? Who does, you know, the people who thumb their nose at holistic planning now realize like, oh, wait, <laughs> that's that's what I got to do. Well, I just, I find it so fascinating, the human element aspect, because I think uh, on one of your podcast episodes, you talked about Robin Williams, and it's this idea of sitting across the table from him and asking Robin, what is it that you want? And I think you also did an episode about the Beastie Boys. And again, it's asking that individual, even if they have a difficult personality at times, because <laughs> they're sometimes surrounded by yes people, but it, it's being able to ask them, what is it that you want? And and then really listening to them and having enough courage to disagree if need be in having that candid type of you know rapport with them. Yeah, and and, and it has to be a conversation because I mean, very few people, even if they came in for you know the express planning of an estate planning meeting, they had time to really think about it. If you just ask them, what do you want? They don't know. Like they they think they know, you know, and they may even be really confident about it. But as you talk about it. They're going to be like, oh, also this. Oh, wait, you know what? That doesn't sound so good. Like they're going to be work. They're going to be talking it out with them in, in their head as they're talking it out with you. And that's why it's so important to do that part. Because you know, sure, you could have just fired me off an email. I said, hey, what do you want your legacy to be? And you say it's X, Y, Z. And you know, we could, have, I guess, create a plan based on that. Um, but you know, for us to sit down and talk for twenty minutes, you know, that even that small amount of time is going to be so dramatically more effective. Um, just because you know, the exchange of ideas sort of begets the exchange of more ideas, right? It gets the juices flowing. Um, the, you know, the questions are asked and answered. And then also when they go home now, they're in that headspace. They've started thinking about the wheels are turning. So then that will beget more questions. They'll maybe talk to their kids about it. So like, I never thought about this. So that's the interesting thing about sort of legacy and estate planning is that the conversations are actually really hard to start because everything's so scary um, and big. <laughs> But once you start them, it's really snowballs. Like it, once you, you know, overcome that initial inertia, um, it, they kind of become self-fulfilling ideas as long as you just sort of, you just have to kind of keep control of them. Yeah. You know, and I quickly sort of spiral into craziness. But I think it, know, in terms of the motion, that's really, you know, kind of is its own thing. Yeah. I, th- I would think that individuals probably would have a lot to say. And I know that your podcast also covered celebrities such as Tom Petty. And, and if there is, let's say a drug scenario, I just wonder if 
a, a part of it is getting curious enough to bring that person back into this reality mm-hmm. compared to them escaping into an alternate reality and 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 just bringing them forward to that you actually want to hear what they have to say compared to because that's so common not so common but i think that can be common more than we'd like to think well i mean absolutely and and that's one of those things you know in the tom petty episode um it, it, it sounds so lawyerly to bring it up like this but the central question of that episode is like what does equal mean um, because I think if you ask anyone sort of what they want to give, how they want to divide their estate between their kids, they're going to be all oh, e- equal, equally. Um, but like, is like, what's fair? What's equal? What does that really mean? Because, you know, if one of your kids is a successful business person married to someone else who, you know, a two income family, just totally put together, um, you know, and, there are, and your other kid maybe has struggled with mental health or a drug, you know, a drug problem of some sort, or even is just sort of a little less well off. Or has just taken a different path. Maybe they're an artist, and you know the 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 money is just going to be more valuable to their dream than it is to the other child. I mean, what's equal in that situation? Um, and that's a different answer. You know, for some people, it's just like the math definition: cut it in half. But for well, others, it's like, well, one of these kids doesn't doesn't necessarily need it, and so maybe you know the other can get more. Um, and but if you're going to do that, that that's the first thing to find out: what do they think of equal? And then the second thing is, well, now. We have to prepare everyone for the fact that this is not going to be numerically equal, right? Because when the kids hear equal, they think equal. And even the kid who doesn't need it, maybe doesn't care so much about the money, but they care about the, you know, the sort of uh, inherent message of them being given less by their parents. And it's, oh my God, wait, you don't love me as much. You always loved him more. And, you know, even though I don't need this money, it's now we're like measuring your love of your children. It's like, so this is why the communication needs to happen while everyone's still around, so that you know they don't find this stuff out from some stranger on a piece of paper after their parents are gone. Absolutely, and it can avoid all those resentments. Yeah, I mean, certain resentments are inevitable, right? You can't plan around everything. Families are going to fight, um, you know, and sometimes the, the the fight is just unavoidable. And all you're trying to do in these plans is mitigate the damage and ensure that it's resolved as quickly as possible. But there are just certain, and that, you know, just because there's a lawsuit or a, a fight of the family doesn't mean that the plan necessarily failed. It often means the plan failed, but it doesn't by definition mean the plan failed because some fights with families, they just have to happen because it has nothing to do with the plan. It has to do with, you know, who came to your baseball game when you were seven and, you know, the lawyers just, you have to take that into account in the planning, but there's, you can't do anything about that, you know, necessarily. Yeah. Well, it's the dynamics that are beyond the paperwork. Yeah, because and I think, you know, you mentioned the Robin Williams episode we did. That was one where the fight was over his bicycle collection, um, which is not a particularly, I mean, it was worth like $100,000, which for, I know that's not, that's not, not a lot of money, but in the, in the frame of the sort of money that was involved in this estate, you know, that's chump change. And the reason that that was the center of it was because that sort of represented him in the eyes of the kids and whoever held that and got that got the most of him. Um, and that's sort of a very different thing when you're sort of talking about planning for wealthy families where it's like, you know, what they fight over isn't necessarily the most valuable. They're not necessarily fighting over the O'Keefe, right? They might be fighting over dad's baseball glove from little league or his chair, you know, and, and because, Oh, that's dad's favorite chair. I want that. It's like, no, I want that. And then there's a hundred million dollar lawsuit because they want that chair. And so you know, these sorts of things that you know, there's no way to, predict and also the people who care about those sorts of things often don't know they care about it until the person's dead so they never you know if you can just say oh we'll just ask them what they want it's like oh i want the chair and someone else says i want the chair well then work that out but they might not even know they want the chair until dad dies or mom dies and then they're struck by it and all of a sudden it becomes the most meaningful thing possible um and so these are the problems that you're dealing with sort of in an estate and sort of trying to manage a family fight. And that's why I say like some of these fights are just going to happen because there's just nothing a lawyer can do about that. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. And it sounds like as many of these conversations that can happen up front, the better it is for the client, the family, the future. Well, I mean, it's, every- just, it's better. It's better for everyone, both from a planning perspective and just from a, like the happiness of the family perspective, really. Yeah. Um, and so you're, you're always sort of playing amateur psychologist and that, does mean that you can sort of unleash some forces that you're not necessarily entirely equipped to deal with. Um, so you, there is an element of recklessness to it, and that you're, you're sort of dealing with forces that are beyond your control. Um, but it's better to have if that if you're going to set off a powder keg, it's better to set it off when everyone's around, 
than it is when you've sort of magically plucked one person out of the web, right? And they're not there to explain themselves. They're not there to, to calm down people. You know, a lot of families, especially nowadays, very complexly blended families, you know, you can have you know, between divorce and, you know, you know, different sort of lifestyles, you can have these very, you know, sort of spread out complex families that really only have maybe one person in common, sort of youth linking them together. And if that person dies and just magically disappeared one day, what's what's linking all these people? You know, nothing. It's gone. So they're going to go at each other's throats. Yeah, and unless so, there can, uh, unless there can be, let's say, a family vision or mission statement or values distilled. And that's where legacy comes in. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm a big uh, proponent. I, I push this idea all the time of a hardcover hardcover coffee table book that can explain like the best life and business lessons, the the uh, the core and aspirational values, even projecting those values forward into the future. So that can be like the theme and the focus. Um, before I move on to my next question, one of the things I've talked about is I had a great grandfather on my dad's side of the family on, on the paternal side, and he was an insurance uh, insurance a successful insurance broker during the great depression. And I very much wish he would have written down his best life and business lessons, mm -hmm. his core values, his guiding principles, all of that. But he didn't know that somebody would have wanted to read it four generations down. So yeah. he just never wrote it. And he had multiple homes, multiple Cadillacs. He, yeah, he did very well during the, the a time when people were, you know, not doing so great. So anyways, yeah. Uh, how how uh, do you approach the preservation and growth of wealth for future generations within the context of estate planning. Uh, again, you know, to not be technical, it's all about involving that next generation that may be under-involved. Um, and how you do that, it doesn't necessarily have to be just give them a job in the business, um, you know, because then you can end up with sort of a, whatever, I forget, Kieran Culkin's character's name in a succession, but sort of who was just doesn't really care about being in the business, just wants to sort of be around his dad. And so they, they involve him in the business, but he's not good at it. He doesn't give a crap. Um, Is that the youngest really doing, son? The youngest son, yeah. It's oh. not like really doing anyone any favors. <laughs> yeah. Ro Roman, I think. Roman, Roman, yeah. Yeah. And so like that would be the old thing to do, right? Just, oh, stick the kid in the business and let him learn from the mailroom or whatever. Um, but that just doesn't help anyone. That can create a lot of resentment, Um both in the people in the business when they see this kid who's just sort of failing upwards because of, you know, whose parents, you know, they have, or you, know, you have this kid who sort of is completely disinterested in the position that he's been given and is not evolving and growing as a person. Um, and sometimes, you know, I keep saying kid, but a lot of times in, in these situations, the kid quote unquote is 60. <laughs> so, sure. Sure. The adult offspring. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, you're dealing with, you know, it's not like, you know, I know a lot, you say kid, you picture like a 17 year old, but it's like this is a 57 year old who's, you know, got certain things going on. And that's, that's a very different conversation. So to find a way to involve them in the legacy planning, um, a lot of ways, you know, philanthropy can really play a powerful role in that. Um, although, again, that's, you know, like anything in this, uh, you have to be careful in terms of, you know, if you, you know, just, realizing and limiting the sort of definition of legacy. This is an area where you know, philanthropy specifically, um, where that sort of idea of keep it simple and, and don't let it get too grandiose and, you know, with your legacy can really take effect because I can't tell you the number of times um, that I've heard of a family that very successfully passes on their philanthropic values to their kids. And like, that's, that's the legacy that they, they really want to pass on, right? Is, is the values of philanthropy. Um, but they perhaps are more passionate about a certain cause that their kids maybe don't care about. So they've passed on successfully the philanthropic values, but now they're also trying to pigeonhole them into, oh, no, but also I want you to be philanthropic about, I don't know, AIDS, right? That's just okay. an example. But and they care the about kids, green forests. Maybe care, yeah, they care about green forests, or they care more about you know humanitarian efforts in Africa or water. You know, there's a million different things. That, so they are philanthropic but they just don't necessarily give a crap about the same thing that their parents cared so deeply about. So you'll often have, like we have a you know, wealthy family with their sort of, you know, in this case, the, the, this hypothetical AIDS foundation um, that then they say, oh, well, I've made philanthropic kids. I want to get them involved. Let me get them involved in the foundation. And now you've done a disservice to the, both the foundation and these kids because now there's an executive likely at this foundation who doesn't care about the cause. And then the kid is like, well, you just drop this burden 
in my lap, right? Because I don't care about this. Like, and so like, I, but you've made me philanthropic. You've succeeded like that. You, if you stop the legacy there, then like, fantastic. You've succeeded wonderfully. You know, your definition of what you're looking for. And as you try to keep pushing for more and more and more, now you've turned that legacy into a burden and you've sort of ruined it. Whereas perhaps, you know, a more open-ended, like here is a certain amount of money put into, you know, an account that you can then invest in, you know, any, you know, you, know, you can give this away in, in the way that you see fit. Sure, and um, the cause and that they believe in. To the causes you care about and then sort of create your own philanthropic legacy. Where the legacy that I have left you is that you are philanthropic. Oh, that's then, a powerful and, conversation. And that is fine. Yeah. yeah. But now in terms of the specific cause that you're philanthropic about, that's you know not up to me. And I think that's something that estate planners deal with a lot of this idea. We call it the dead hands, <laughs> where it's because you can write things into contracts and into into documents that like you can get this if you do this and you do that and you marry this person, then you'll get all it's like the Brewster's millions situation, right? Well, sure, well, it's also movie? a little bit of control from the grave, but keep going. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's called dead hand control. And this is that same sort of idea where it's like they're kind of trying to mold their kids even from beyond where it's like, okay, well, you know, it's not enough for me to have made you philanthropic. I've got to make you philanthropic about this. And even if they don't intend it that way, it, well, it's, it's, it could still manifest that way. It's so interesting because there's on one hand, on one hand, there's an individual's legacy. And then on the other hand, there's a collective or a family legacy and an individual still has to grow and, and, and not have their wings clipped so that they can evolve and transform into who it is that they authentically need to be. And yeah, still, I mean, what maybe... good is a legacy if you're buried under it, right? Like it should well, be sure, or if the, or if others, it should be something that lifts you or... up or, or and, and betters you. It shouldn't be something that crushes you. Yeah, yeah, but it's so interesting. So I I can only imagine as an attorney, you have to make space for all of this, and it's very hard to do that in the four corners of a document. Which is why, you know, you can't write all of these contingencies and all of these oh, but do this, but not that into a document. It's just not realistic. It's insane. To even identify all these problems or possibilities before they happen is just beyond the possibility of comprehension, right? So that's well, why the conversations that we talked about earlier are so important and to make sure that they're happening because now you're just heading off as much as you can before you have to rely on just what's on this page. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, the document has, has to be, what do they, what did they say? Flexible enough, but clear enough mm -hmm. with enough clarity, but flexible enough that it can change with the times. But yeah, it's... Uh, you're dealing with this human element and you're right. Once you open up a uh, Pandora's box, sometimes people have a lot to say. And, and, and sometimes I would think you're, you would, you, you would uh, respond back. I, I just wanted to write this document and, and they're, they have so much to say. And yeah. I think you're happy if, if I mean, I don't you know. I think personally as an, as a modern advisor, if you ask a client a simple question and they come back with a massive info dump about their personal life, I think you just chalk that up as a win. Like that's an engaged client. That's someone who trusts you. That's someone who is who gives a crap about whatever you know, whatever question you asked, you know, in this case, be it about legacy or whatever, it has struck enough of a nerve that they have now like given you all this. They've tossed all this into your lap. And it's like, okay, well now you know, this is great. I now I have this person has trusted in me. I have the responsibility to handle this properly as an advisor. So I I, I would consider that, you know, that's what you're looking for in a way. Yeah. Well, it's uh it means they care. Yeah, I mean it means they give a crap about the question you're asking. The worst thing is that if the advisor is more invested in the plan than the client is, it, you know, how can I be more invested in your children's future than, than you are? That's not, that's not how this should be. It's not going to work. Yeah. How do you navigate the complexities of family dynamics and potential conflicts when handling wealthy estates? Uh, well, this, you know, again, like I said, for every single, I think every answer so far, you know, as I predicted at the beginning, that is just communication, um, you know, how the, what form that takes, I think, is interesting for a lot of families. Um, you know, depending, and this obviously depends on wealth level. But you know, a family meeting is anyone can do that. You can just say like Sunday, we're sitting down and we're talking about this, and you know, because you know we're going to grandma's house for a holiday or whatever, and people are going to be around, people are alive. Like, let's just quickly bring up the estate, and you know, you know, quickly is it doesn't end up quickly. It ends up probably with yelling. But that's a good thing. <laughs> like, they're communicating. Least, they've yeah. communicated and you've started yeah. the ball. Um, so like that's something that any family can do. Now, as you climb the wealth level, you know, the wealth ladder. Now, I mean, I've seen families, you know, there's there's certain advisories, you know, I mean JP Morgan offers all, you know, I know for example, offers all sorts of classes 
and things like that, where you know, sort of they're effectively mediating within the family and trying to pass, you know, teach the kids about money, even younger children, um, and sort of create, you know, this you know, sort of mold them from the beginning in a more sort of structured situation. Um, I know, uh, you know, Mitzi Purdue, Frank Purdue's wife. Uh, I spoke with her. She's a very interesting woman because she's also, uh, I believe, the heir to um, oh, to a hotel chain. So she's a double heir. Where she herself, her parents owned a hotel chain, and then she inherited Frank Purdue's chicken conglomerate. Um, she also her... happens to be very hardworking. But go ahead. Oh yeah, no, she's brilliant. Um, and she, I know, her, in her family, she told me they have a, a newsletter that they send out, like that they actively, you know, they actively have people working on. It. They send around a family newsletter that sort of tells everyone in the family what everyone else is up to and what's great and what's going on. And just, and they send um. You know, little boxes, almost like uh, like birch boxes or little like uh, I guess subscription boxes, sort of some things to the kids, where it's like, oh, here's you know grandma's recipe for pie, you know great grandma's pie recipe, make this with your mom, and there's all the ingredients to make it. So you know, and these are things you can do on a lesser scale. You know, these are all scalable ideas, right? Like if you're if you don't need to send that to every member of the family, just do that with your with your son or daughter. <laughs> you know? But it's like so proactive. Like, you know, it's just but it's yeah, it's just doing it's do anything. <laughs> like doing that, that that's the big i think lesson here these things are so scary and they're so difficult to get started with that just do anything is so much like it's so much more like you get so much value from just the end like that binary of i have done nothing versus i have done something is so worthwhile even if that something is tiny absolutely and less regrets that feeling yes. of less regrets afterwards yes absolutely yeah, I, I love that pie example uh, regarding the, the recipe because it's so simple, but it can not only demonstrate a, a core value, but it also is a unifying factor. So then the focus is not on just like the assets and the money, but rather that we're, we're humans, we, we get to share a human experience and we all like apple pie, pumpkin uh, pie, lemon meringue pie. It's one of those things where like, depending on the sort of family values you're trying to pass on, it, it can be all sorts of things like I'm, we're doing this with the son, with our son and our daughter. So that we want to, you know, we're encouraging them instead of just do it. That sounds a different message than just doing it with your daughter, which would be sort of the traditional way, right? But no, this is, you know, baking pies is not necessarily just for women. This is something that, you know, everyone, egalitarianism, everyone can do this. If, if the son wants to do this, this is a perfectly reasonable thing for him to do. And so in you send these messages even without meaning to uh, about, you know, when you're trying to pass on your legacy. And all of these little things are part of your legacy. They're part of who you know, your children are the part of what your family stood for and what sort of people it leaves in the world. And how you lived your values. And how you lived your values. <laughs> what are some of the common pitfalls or mistakes that individuals should be aware of when planning their estates? Uh, so over control is always the big one. Trying to do too much, trying to define things because you know, it's a legal document. So the, your instinct is to be like, let's really define things to death. Um, and in certain situations, that good, that's good. You know, if we were writing a contract for the sale of widgets, then yeah, let's define every single possible thing. But when we're talking about, you know, what, what things yes. we're giving to our kids and how, how what that's going to do, that's just such a more uh, evolving, delicate situation than just like I give you X dollars, you give me X widgets on this schedule. Um. So, and the more you try to control a lot of times, the more problems you create rather than solve. So there's like a, there's an interesting balance of like hitting the right level of f flexibility and control and certain things you just sort of like have to let Jesus take the wheel. Um, and that's just the way it is because you're only at that point going to do harm if you try to get involved and fix it. It's fascinating because on one hand, uh, children, even adult children, require a little bit of structure, framework mm -hmm. to know kind of where the guardrails are. But on the other hand, I would imagine that 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 over control could lead to rebellion just in the, the well, just sheer fact principle. of human nature. Yeah. yeah, just like don't hit the right button. I mean, you know, the, a great example of this is there's a lot of times where, you know, families want their children to marry within the religion, right? Especially if it's like, um, you know, a, a smaller religion or, you know, where you know, like in Judaism, where there's just, you know, every hundred years, someone gets the brilliant idea to kill all the Jews. And so let's, you know, then maybe the more likely, to, you know, I, as a Jewish person, um, you know, it's like, oh, I marry a Jew. It's important. You got to sort of appropriate the actual, the religion. And, you you know, the, the tribe. and there's a way to do that by imparting the value of Judaism to your children throughout their life, or in this case, Christianity, whatever your, your religion is. Um, the way not to do that is 
you're not going to get your inheritance unless you marry a Jewish person. And that's sure. a real thing that people do. And that's legal. <laughs> like that's perfectly legal to do that and have that in your will. Um, but it's interesting but because it, then it, 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 but that's a different approach. And those are the two poles, but it's like, that's what leaving legacy is. You can't just magically leave your legacy in the document. It's left by what you do throughout life. Yeah. Yeah. We want legacy to be a happy word that, uh, brings uh, joy to one's hearts compared to, oh my gosh, you know, dad and mom's legacy was so restrictive. And then they, yeah, they resent that word yeah. legacy. Yeah, we don't want that. If you want to you know, push your kids towards certain causes, then you have to show them through their life the value of those causes, you know, and, and naturally and, and gradually. You can't just be like, surprise, you have to do this. <laughs> this is what I care about, so you have to care about it. It's like, it sounds silly we're saying it like that, but it happens fairly often. Well, it's so interesting because sometimes with parents, they almost see it as a, a compliment to their identity. If the child is in the same for profession, if the child is is an extension of their identity. And yeah, and the flip side of that is that it is a personal insult to their identity if the child is not. And, you know, there's a certain there's a level of arrogance involved there. Of like I made you in my image, you know, which is language I chose, you know, purposefully. Um, that parents need to sort of stay away from, you know, where it's like, yeah, yes, I made you, but, and I, and I've molded you a certain way, but at a certain point, you are your own, you're not just a clone of me that I've made. You're a whole other person who has entirely different life experiences and you're going to turn out to be an entirely different person, no matter what I do. So, you know, there's a certain element of like trying to pass on the good and then just stopping and letting him go or letting her go. Yeah. Yeah, that's why these conversations are really important. But also, I can imagine sometimes the conversations are going to get into areas that are going to be, uh, ooh, they could trigger some emotions because if somebody is uh, committed to a belief and they have to become flexible on that belief, it'll just, uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the hard, you know, that's the hard part of doing all this. That's why people are scared. That's why the conversations are tough to start because, you know, frankly, the, it's inevitable that you run into something like that. And then how do you, you know, navigate that? Yeah. A, yeah. How many families do you know where like that the parents and kids are just in lockstep on every single aspect of their day? It just doesn't exist. You know, it's like, it's not like a Stepford Wives situation like that, where, you know, new generations, different generations have different life experiences and different values. And, you know, you can pass on the same core values, but how those values manifest in the current world is totally different. And, and you know, just think about how much the world changes. Just, I don't know what. When was the iPhone invented? Like 20 years ago, right? Imagine, just try to remember what the world was like before everyone had smartphones and try to think about, well, how does that change just how the basis, like the basics of life are? And then how do your values interact with that? You know what I mean? And that's just a weird example, but it's like so much, it has upended the entire world in a 20 year period. And now you're trying to make an estate plan that's supposed to last 80 years <laughs> like how like yeah you, you have to at a certain point you just have to allow that certain things are going to be interpreted differently 20 years from now and that just goes from the way the world is i mean language obviously is a big one you know what words are okay to say what words are not okay to say that's constantly changing and you have to pay respect to that that has to be allowed for that can't be something that you rail against it's just like well that's you know that's just the way the world is, is in the future. And my values now will have to survive contact with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a big responsibility, but uh, I think it's also a very meaningful one because to have something there is better than to have nothing there. You know, to have the conversations are better than to not have the conversations. And even if it's uh, clumsy to begin with, uh, I, I think the client is always better by having the estate plan than, than never having explored it and have dodged it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you discuss the role of philanthropy or charitable giving within estate planning for affluent individuals. See, I touched on this one inadvertently a bit earlier um, in terms of its role in, you know, involving a child. And I think that's, I think. Kind of know, an educational talking, platform. Yeah, having an educational platform. I think it's a great way also just to, you know, if you want to like prepare a child for being in the business and how to, you know, the value of money, this is money that you can give them to manage that, the fail case, if you give a child money to uh, $10,000 to invest, you might just lose all that money and, and nothing happens. Like nobody gains, right? You've just lost $10,000. Maybe the child's learned a lesson. Maybe not. 
Um, if you give a child ten thousand dollars to give to a charity, even if he gives it to quote unquote the wrong charity, there's that, that's the fail case, and it's like okay, but ten thousand dollars are given to charity, like it's the the worst case scenario is still a net positive with philanthropy. So even if they mismanage the money, the money has still been given away to charity and not lost. And so that I think you know philanthropy in that way can be a good tool for teaching the value of money and um, responsibility to children in these sort of wealthier families where the stakes are super low and you're also sort of backdoor passing on your philanthropic values um, and ensuring that, but nothing will ever be lost really. It's only a net positive for, for the world um, yeah, for, as so opposed to just giving a kid cash to blow. Sure. A triple win. Yes. Yeah. Would you provide some examples of successful estate planning strategies that have helped preserve and grow the wealth of affluent families? Hey, um, this one, I mean, probably more technical than we want to get, um, especially in this day and age where, um, you know, individual estate tax exemptions are so high that the vast majority of Americans, the vast, vast majority won't interact with the federal estate tax at all. Um, but still, just sort of very basic instruments can carry a lot of water. Um, you know, with estate planning, it's one of those things where like 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the result. And then getting that, let if you want to squeeze out that last 20%, you can, but that's going to take exponentially more technique and effort than that first 80% did. And obviously, I just completely made those numbers up. But the it's the sentiment that matters there that um, just by virtue of like looking at your estate, having a will, maybe having a trust, thinking about where you want these things to go, having a healthcare proxy, just the very basic documents don't take much to set up, don't cost much to set up, and their value is enormous. If you want to get crazy or you're a family with more means and you really have to do intense tax planning, then, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money and just put in a lot of effort to maximize things um, in that regard. But realistically, what's going to carry the most water in terms of your family is those basics. Um, and those basics, anyone can do them. You know, it doesn't take much. You know, you can find, you know, it, find, it's, all it comes down to is finding a lawyer. And, you know, most of the time you're in for under a thousand dollars for these things, you know, depending on where you live. It's an, that's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's enough because, you know, but it's better. It's so much better than nothing and so much more valuable compared to what putting additional effort in will sort of garner. You know what I mean? You put it in if you want to, but you get such a return on sort of the very basic aspects of an estate plan. Well, absolutely. To have something uh, to, to even, even just like you had said, to begin the conversation, like uh, especially with two thirds of today's affluent being self-made, they might not know because it wasn't a conversation growing up at, the, at their kitchen table to have the will or to even consider a trust or, you know, all the different variations of trust or even the, uh, and you know. Also, I think encompassed in that is the idea that, you know, estate planning, we talk a lot about death, but estate planning documents nowadays include things like living wills and healthcare proxies. Um, and lifestyle. Super valuable documents. Um, that So estate planning encompasses sort of late in life end of life and death planning. And so, I mean, personally, my father <clears throat> died from a stroke and he was 55. So we obviously, you know, his documents weren't as in place. You know, he had a will, but he didn't have like a healthcare proxy and such in place because you didn't expect a 55 year old to drop dead. Um, so he was on life support for several days and we weren't allowed to take him off because we didn't have the healthcare proxy. So we had to like go through hospital administration and just have this vegetable sitting there for like three, four days. And like that, needless to say, sucked. <laughs> so, you know, on top of, you know, the fact that he's dead is just to go through this, this additional sort of trauma, this, you know, and so things like that where healthcare, pro healthcare proxy would have saved my family that, that trauma, that, you know, that effort and, 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 the grief. and yeah, that, that grief. And, so these are just valuable documents to have in place. And also, the, I mean, they can make they can make the difference between life and death, first of all, when someone is there, you know, just by getting the bureaucratic stuff out of the way for healthcare decisions to be made. I mean, I think that's the more 
normal use case, if we're being obvious, rather than having sort of a vegetable that, you know, you want to get rid of. But, yeah. you know, it's it's these, that, that end of life aspect is, is very important. And those are very basic documents that honestly, a lot of attorneys don't even charge you for it. They just like throw it in with the will. And I mean, nowadays, those documents are often probably more valuable than the will itself for a lot of families. Because you never know what's right around the corner. Yeah, and that's what you're going to interact with, right? You don't, if you don't have that much stuff to give away, or it's like, I have one child, he's getting everything. Then, I mean, how valuable is the will really? But that healthcare proxy, that holds value. (laughs) You're going to get sick. Like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting because there's this idea sometimes that if somebody has money, then they can be insulated or protected from hardships, heartache, trauma, et cetera. And yet, lo and behold, like like one of the things your podcast talks about is with, with affluence, the volume can be turned up, but yet these are regular human experiences, regular human rites of passage that everyone is going to face or most people will face. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's sort of the whole point of this episode, right? The legacy, it, it doesn't have to be giant, right? It doesn't have to be these big, scary things. It can be simple, simple things. It can be simple documents. It can be simply raising children that are good people or that are, are philanthropic, full stop. You know, it doesn't have to be this, you know, oh, my child is the head of the foundation for AIDS research in this in this space and He's the head of, and it's like, no, you don't have to do that. You've, you've left your legacy of creating that philanthropic child is enough. And you need to know that that is enough and because it, that then that gives the child room to add their legacy onto the legacy you left for them. And so you, know, you need to leave space for the family legacy to blossom really in that regard as more family members are born and die and you know, and, and and it becomes its own growing living thing, which it can't be if you're crushing people under this weight of expectation and of over sort of, you know, forcing them into into a certain rut or a certain definition of what our family does. Or, you know, this idea of our family doesn't do that. It's like, that's a killer. Yeah. Or avoiding a performance based <laughs> legacy. Yes. Very nice insights. Wow. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I think I just want to say before I ask you about how how you define the word legacy personally, I just find it so interesting that um, that there definitely has to be room to have these open uh, conversations where uh, it can be expanded beyond just the here and now of what's culturally acceptable, but also this idea of um you know, this, uh, like regarding the role of philanthropy and the charitable giving, it's, it's, you know, we're more than our money or we're more than just, you know, um, yeah, um, I'm trying to find the right words right now on the spot, but it, it, it's, it has to do with this idea of purpose of, of living for more than oneself uh, in service to others. And, and, and again, living that and, and showing that and walking that talk. Yeah, absolutely. So since this is a legacy podcast, what does the word person, what does the word legacy personally mean to you? I mean, you know, obviously I, I define it very small um, because I want to give, you know, personally the most room for that legacy to grow. I think, you know, it's arrogant to uh, assume more than that and to force more than that into the world. Um, Now, you know, that's, you know, I happen to be a not extremely, you know, I'm not a billionaire um, and, and that it takes a certain level of arrogance to succeed um, a certain level of, you could even say a certain level of mental illness if you want um, to, to succeed at that level, right? There's a certain mindset that has to happen. The same as being a, a professional athlete. Like there's just a certain level of arrogance and self-belief that you just is required. Otherwise you couldn't fathom that you could even reach those heights, let alone actually do it. Um, so the key here, you know, for someone like me, who's just like, you know, I'm an editor of a website and I have a podcast, like it's easy for me to define my legacy as like, be good people. Um, that's a harder pill to swallow for um, more wealthy and successful people. And that, that's sort of where advisors can come in and try to bring them back down to earth and cut back down to the core of what they're actually really trying to pass on, right? That, that idea, because, you know, you can... You know, they want to leave, you know, their legacy is their name in stars. You know, that's why people put their name on things you know, when they, when they, you know, when they give gifts. That's why, you know, you have the John Jones auditorium or whatever. You don't need to do that. 
Uh, people do that because they see that as the legacy, right? They, they, they want to be a patron of the arts and they want people to know that they're a patron of the arts. And, you know, that's a totally fine way to go about it. Maybe that's the, the perfect, you know, harmless way to do it is that, okay, just put your name on a thing. Um, you know, it's really a question of, of what it means to the individual. And, and for me, you know, it's a small thing. It doesn't need to be this strangling uh, concept. It, it should be something that's freeing and, and sort of informs you and helps you guides you through your life rather than is a thing you're carrying around and having to like base your decisions on and sort of limits your decisions it should help you make the right decisions not force you into certain decisions that's wonderful thank you that's uh that was more honesty than i expected no. <laughs> that's very humbling i uh thank you um and then my my final uh, couple of questions are you know what are the core values aspirational values i know that you're a father right now so there's kind of this depth and breadth that it's not just living for yourself right now, but it's also kind of being head of a household and. Sure. I mean, I, honestly, I mean, if we're talking honestly, I'm, I just, we're just figuring out trying to keep this kid alive at this point. <laughs> it's like, we're like one year in, it's like, don't want to knock on wood any jinxes. Um, you know, it, this is, I mean, it's, it's, we haven't even thought about these ideas of legacy yet because it's just so new. And I think it's easy to get, you know, I see now that I have kids of my own, how easy it is to sort of get caught up in like the, the stress and craziness of just sort of like managing my own life and this other human life that I'm suddenly in charge of and, you know, taking time to sit down and think about like, okay, you know, think at least um, purposely and then sort of um, about, well, how am I going to guide this child and what's my plan is it can be really easy just to not ever do that. Um, so, you know, a lot of, you know, I'm talking, very bluntly in this episode about sort of oh do this don't do this this is so simple it's like obviously like it's not so simple this is family this is all hard stuff um but you know applying any of it creates such value and that's why i say it like that because it's like nobody's going to do all these things it's just too much um but the bits and pieces that you can pull out and the bits and little bits that you can do and actually do and with your family are just so valuable for the effort they take and for what they, they may seem so such a pittance. And, but just even taking the time to think about it sometimes is mega valuable and just worthwhile. Like just stopping and being like, Oh, what is the legacy I want? You know, what do I want this kid to be like is, you know, it's easy to just not do that. I would say that some of your values might, in, might include truth, education, humility, a growth mindset, self-awareness, well, I'm, I guess, thank you for, you know, I think you've done the, the advisor job there and probably put more thought into it than I have at this point, but uh, that's what I'm talking about. Like, I, you know, you, who, who you asked this question, who, who knows the answer? I mean, I'm, I'm figuring it out as I'm talking, right? And, and that sort of, sort of proves the, the value of having the conversation in the first place because, you know, you don't know. Yeah. Um, are there any final thoughts you'd like to, to share about this idea of one, designing their legacy. I know that you're coming from the context of, uh, of an estate planning attorney, but any 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 other human thoughts or emotional intelligence thoughts or legal thoughts? I mean, talk to your kids, I guess. <laughs> I know it seems, uh, I don't mean it to sound condescending because, I mean, my kid doesn't even talk yet. So I'm, I'm not currently talking to my kids. I mean, I talk at him, but um you know, how do you get to know what what they like and what they are and, and without the communication, without you know, spending some time to listen to what they have to say about things? I mean, even if that thing is is completely anathema to what you believe, um, then that's, you know, that that's created a problem perhaps in the family, but it's now a problem that you can work on. And now you know something very important, uh, you know, about your relationship with your child that you maybe you didn't know before. And that can now inform everything else you do for the rest of your life. Um, you know, just because maybe you sat down for 20 minutes, you know, and asked them you know, what they thought about X, Y, Z in the news or something and right. listen to what they had to say instead of telling them what they should think about X, Y, Z in the news. Oh, that is precious. <laughs> Especially given the asset of time and yeah. understanding time is not, uh, it's a non-renewable resource and, just realizing that those ordinary conversations every day can be that extraordinary moments to um, build that trust in the communication and 
Yeah. This I mean, it's never, and it's never too late to start. Like I said, when you say, when I say kids, yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can undo, but you know, if your kid is, is 55, you know, <laughs> sitting down with them, maybe even more meaningful now, if you've never done it before than, uh, than it would have been when he was five or six. So, um, you know, it, it family, family's tough, man. And it's funny, but you, know, you got to put the work in and the communication is king. Yeah. Thank you so much, David, for your time today. I, I very much appreciate it. And there have been so many great insights from today's podcast episode, today's conversation, uh, everything from it being less about the assets, even if the metaphor was about, you know, initially we talked about the family, the Roy's uh, in that uh, succession series on television, uh, it being less about the assets and more about understanding, you know, perhaps that, you know, what are the underlying problems? And if uh, you can address in, um, not just increased communication, but just increasing that trust and the respect for one another. I, I think that you had referred to it um, before as, uh, you know, death doesn't have to be the scary topic, but sometimes that is the lead in to this idea of bringing up estate planning. But once you get past that roadblock, how much people want to say and share, and and also just like you had mentioned, also about evolving, involving the next generation um, in, in, a, in a fair way, not that they fail upwards, but rather that they can understand that uh, there's a value to money and the shared responsibility uh, to both to grow themselves, but also to understand, you know, what it, it is that their parents could have valued and, and also the struggles that come with uh, individuals that are, let's say, gaining wealth for the first time and mm -hmm. their, their uh, company could be that baby, their baby. And then what are the ripple effects of that? So I, I'm just going to um, thank you uh, so much, David. I'm going to read out the closing paragraph and and please just share what's the the best way somebody could find your podcast or website. Oh yeah, so uh, wealthmanagement.com, and uh, the podcast is called uh, Celebrity Estates. It's available on all major podcast providers, or you can just find it on wealthmanagement.com, whatever you prefer. And uh, thanks so much, Angelina. It's been really fun. Okay, I'm just going to read out my closing paragraph real quick. So um, I'm Angelina Carlson, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder of Legacy Planning, a boutique coaching and advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, but international in those I coach. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education and preparation in the moat or moot around your castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content on this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if you're checking us out on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate and review. And thank you so much, David Lennick, for speaking into your legacy.